Hello everybody, we thought we'd do our very first interview and very originally I'm going to interview my husband. This is Josh, in case you didn't know him. Um, it's a little bit of a weird setup, he's sitting in the living room and I'm sitting in our bedroom um, because we had a long, well not that long, we had a discussion about whether it would look better if I sat next to him and interviewed him and I was like it's going to look weird. So we're doing it this way. I hope it works. If it doesn't work and we look like idiots, tell us. Because no one likes to look like an idiot on the internet. Uh, although I'm sure most of us do. Um, I just And moved. I'm sure that everybody knows this already, but this is Megan. Oh, yeah. Hi. I'm Megan. Uh, that was good. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Josh some questions about his dissertation. Um, because it's come up a couple of times on the non sequitur show. People have been asking what it's about. It is freely available on the website academia.edu. I'll is there put there any link. way to make it m available? Can everybody get that? You I... have to have an account? It's free to sign up for Academia. Um, oh, yeah. But I'll look and see if there's a better way of getting it out there, as it were. But I'll put a link in the description, so if you have a spare day and a half to spend reading a 500 odd page discussion of uh, esoteric Sumerian ritual, you go right ahead. Yeah, and if you guys uh, feel like sending me your notes on the edition of the Sumerian tablet that I that I do in the, in the back, yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> anyway, so we are going to get started. So Josh, um, I thought it would be nice if you could begin by giving us just an overview of your dissertation, what you wrote on, um, and why you think it's relevant just to the world, life. Why should I care about MSL? Oh, wow. And we'll get to what MSL is in a minute, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, so maybe broad flyover sort of view. Uh, there is a man. I really thought I was prepared for your questions, and then that one, that one, the one that you know you're going to get asked, <laughs> uh, the elevator question. So there is a city um, from the old Babylonian period, which is um, well, these texts are from like the 18th century, um, just after the reign of Hammurabi, probably during his reign maybe but just right around this period so the really cool period <laughs> the period um, everyone knows about that's right because they know about us <laughs> um sorry so uh during this period the city kish um which is near babylon um you know maybe th this is a better way to let, let's, let's do it a different way um I need about six hours more sleep or three more cups of coffee. Okay. So, in Mesopotamia, um, a lot of things are made out of mud brick. Right? Most of the buildings are made out of mud brick. So, or at least mud brick was a substantial part. Temples were made out of mud brick. So, mud brick only lasts, what, 50 years, something like that, mm -hmm. before you have to redo the structure. You have to tear, tear it down, down and build it back, build it back up. So, uh, you know, the gods lived in those temples, and uh, as I suppose you would if somebody came and started tearing your house down, uh, the gods got pissed, right? And I'd be so pissed. that was the fear. That was the fear of the Mesopotamians, particularly the priests. Um, because if the god leaves. Because he's angry this, that you're tearing his house down. Yeah, I mean, he's like, well, screw this, I'm out of here. And if the god leaves, and we, we know this from a number of sources, but there are some really popular literary texts that, that show this sort of thing, but if the god leaves, all kinds of bad stuff happens to the city. So um, it was the job of the priest, a particular kind of priest, it was a gala, G-A-L-A, or Akkadian, that's Sumerian, the Akkadian would be Kalu. Uh, that gala priest was responsible for kind of calming the god down in a sense mm -hmm. um and and you know that's literally what he did in the text is to calm the heart to assuage him to uh to get him to say hey settle down it's okay you know uh 
we know we're destroying your house, but I promise you're going to have a really nice new one. En suite bathroom, sunroom, all that good stuff. Get that two car garage that you wanted. Yep, exactly. Um, And so the, the way that they did that, the primary way, was to recite these things called laments. And the reason they're called laments is um, they, they're they sort of, narrative's not the right word, but they're, they, they describe what would happen if the God left. So, um, you know, if, you're, if your 10-year-old, you know, you, you, your, uh, your 10-year-old said to you, mom and dad, you can't leave because if you leave, uh, and don't come back for a week, you know, the, the garbage is going to pile up and mice are going to get in and I'm going to blow the microwave up and, you know, uh, people are going to break in and, you know, whatever. Uh, that's sort of what the priest was doing. The priest was saying, hey, uh, you know, if you leave, everything's going to go downhill. So we're going to have floods, we're going to have storms, we're going to have all these terrible things come in, famine, people are going to be abducted, people are going to invade, and all this stuff. So please don't, don't go anywhere. So the reason they're called laments, of course, is that when you read the texts, um, they appear to be just long descriptions of horrible things happening to the city. Um, so the, the people are lamenting. And uh, these, well, it's probably going to be a later question when they're used, but um, so... Okay, that's the background. This is a very long elevator ride, and I'm sorry about that. Um, i got to get better at my elevator speech for my dissertation. Anyway, so these texts, we have lots of them, uh, but most of them come from the first millennium. Okay. Um, they, were, they were canonized during that period and, um, and of course, really well preserved and so uh, we've got lots of them but we do have a f- we have enough from the old babylonian period this period from mm-hmm. 2000 to 1595 roughly um where we can we can say something about them and uh I'll, so they've been they've been published in many of the cities that we found them so th- th- from which they've been excavated but kish there was a whole host of them there and uh and where is kish in mesopotamia uh so if you if you think where babylon is tigers and euphrates kind of come up come close um it's close to that you know it, North. we just have to put a, a map up and we need to do that don't we sorry everybody gotta put a map up um but uh kish was sort of a really important city in the third millennium and it became less important politically, but it still had a lot of re- religious significance um, during this period. So um, it makes sense that there'd be a lot of these lament texts there. There were two major temples uh, on the two major mounds. And um, anyway, so there's a whole bunch of these lament tablets that were found there back in um you know, the early part of the 20th century. But some of them had been worked through, um, but but not a lot of them. And there, there are two primary reasons for that. Um, one, they're very fragmentary. So if you look at them, you know, they're not these, you know, beautiful tablets that have 100 lines and are really well preserved or something like that. They're these little fragments, you know, a little broken off corner, a little center of the tablet, you know, it's broken all around. Mm-hmm. Some of them had 12 lines of text. Some of them had six, some of them had 50, you know, but, but, um, they were incomplete, which makes them really hard to work with. So people really tend to hard. avoid them. And now, now some of them, in spite of that were worked through, but usually, uh, these were duplicates. So let me explain that for a second so when you have um just like with the new testament text or the old testament text uh or really i guess any composition that you have multiple copies of something um if it's not preserved perfectly um what you can do is you can get all gather all the copies together and maybe 
maybe the top of this tablet is broken um, and so you don't have the first three lines but maybe this tablet has the first the top three lines and right? overlaps so can, with what you already have so you can kind of piece it together like a jigsaw that's exactly right so you know when you, whenever you do a text edition whenever you take one composition like the flood story for example the Sumerian flood story you would gather up all the tablets that you have that have the Sumerian flood story on it um, it's not a great example because there just aren't that many um, anyway it doesn't matter and you would copy out <clears throat> all of the uh, lines that are preserved and then you try to line them up and and piece the thing together that way um, so there are some standard sort of texts that occur in this old Babylonian period they haven't become canonized yet or standardized whatever word you want to use um, but there are some you know pretty pretty popular texts that are copied in different cities and so what what people have done for example there's a text called Ura Ama Irabi in Sumerian which means that city which has been plundered and um, of course you can tell just from the name it's a lament right that city which has been plundered um, but it's a very it's a long text and uh, very popular lots of copies uh, in the old Babylonian period all the way down into the first millennium and uh, it's copied in a lot of different places so when somebody went to put an edition together um, they went to all the duplicates of that text right well if you if you have really well preserved copies of it in another city it's really easy to place, match up the tiny right, fragments just, you have from Kesh that's right and you can say okay I know what it says right and this tablet okay that even though I only have three signs in that line I know that they match up that line there so that means the next line is probably yep that next line is this so it's sort of easy so so people work through those fragments mm. and that was good uh, it was helpful but the problem is that um, so, so that's uh, one problem is that they were very fragmentary and so um, if if the fragment wasn't a duplicate of a known text, people really didn't bother too much with it. And that brings up uh, the second problem with those tablets, and that is they're, they're written phonetically, most of them, <laughs> many of them. Um, and what do I mean by that? Of course, everybody listening probably knows, but just in case. Um, if I were to spell the word dogs, I would spell it D-O-G-S. Right? But if I were to spell it phonetically, dogs, I would say D write D-O-G-Z, because that S sounds like a Z. You're writing how dog. it sounds, not how it's spelled. That's exactly right. Well, that's how these tablets were spelled. Um, so we could talk about this in a minute, but it's essentially you have Sumerian, and then you have a sociolect or a dialect, whatever, whatever you want to call it, of, of, of um, Sumerian called Emesol. And then you have, which is, so this is already pretty esoteric. Sumerian is pretty esoteric. Then you have, <clears throat> anyway, then people were writing Emesol phonetically. phonetically. So it's like everyone's greatest nightmare. Just kidding. But it was, it's a frustrating <laughs> thing to do. Uh, so they're very fragmentary, they're unduplicated, and they're written phonetically. So you. <laughs> You have to figure out what Sumerian word they're trying to represent in this dialect. Right. Um, I didn't sleep much. Just kidding. But uh, I'm not kidding. I didn't sleep much. But so people didn't want to mess with it. So I'm masochistic. So I did. Uh, and it was fun. So I know the answer to this, but just because the people listening aren't going to. Did you go through all of the texts at Kish, or a particular subgroup, or...? Yeah, I mean, yes, yes, all of them, to varying degrees. So, um, I really haven't answered your first question yet, have It's I? all good, we'll get there. Um, my bad, everybody. Um, so, there are a lot of different texts at Kish, like there are at any other city during that period, but most periods. Um, you don't just have these laments. You have, you know, religious mythologies. You have, li you know, literature. Accounts. You have administrative texts, mathematical texts. Um, 
um, regular literary texts. Um, so, you know, I went through them to categorize them, to catalog them. Um, and then what I did in my dissertation was to focus on two primary groups, the biggest, uh, maybe not the biggest, but two substantial groups. One uh, was all of the, what are called curricular texts uh, that were found at Kish. So anything that was used in scribal education, call those curricular texts from curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then to look at all the lamentational liturgies. Uh, so these laments that we're talking about. And um, I could talk about that in a little more detail later, but the, the, the big thing, the big point of doing all of this, let's just go back to the, the broad overview. Nobody had worked through these things systematically as a whole, so we didn't really know what was there in total, um, and we didn't know, um, I guess I have to, scribal education was a big thing during the old Babylonian period. We didn't know how they did it at Kish, so that was one question I was trying to answer. How did they do scribal education? Mm -hmm. um, were the laments, these lamentational liturgies, were they used in scribal education at Kish? Uh, since so many of them were found there, did they use them in scribal education? Um, and then secondly, uh, what's the deal with these phonetically written texts? What's on them? What deities are being worshipped primarily mm -hmm. uh, or being lamented to primarily? Um, and, and is there some way that we can figure out why they're writing these things phonetically? So that was sort of... Um, that was sort of the, the onus, maybe, or mm -hmm. the, the point, what I was trying to get at. So um, why does it matter? It's a good question. Um, I mean, it matters to me for probably different reasons. But, you know, thinking about it more broadly, of course, I have a, a very um, strong Hebrew Bible background. And one of the things that we know is there's so much intertextuality, uh, particularly first millennium influence, of, of particularly Mesopotamian culture on, on the biblical text. And one of the things that we know about the first millennium uh, Akkadian and Sumerian traditions is that they were, um, although they were standardized to a, a, to a high level during the first millennium, there's significant influence of the traditions from the second millennium that are coming down into the first. Mm. And so uh, trying to get at this proto tradition um, is very important because you can see, for example, at Kish, that there are certain um, patterns, certain certain textual idiosyncrasies that are seen at Kish mm -hmm. that get transmitted down into the first millennium. Whereas you might expect that something from other cities might come down, uh, but it but it comes from Kish. And they're subtle, um, but they're important uh, just to understand how that, that tradition uh, influenced and, and what, what the lines of transmission, how complex the, the lines of transmission were. Um, but, but I think in a, in a much broader sense, you know, understanding religious conceptualizations, um, how it is that they viewed, I mean, just thinking about how they assuaged a deity. Mm -hmm. um, it is really important to understand um, the religious concepts and, uh, and ritual practices that were done. Um, and we have such great evidence from the first millennium, and it's harder to find it from the old Babylonian period. And this, this added another piece to the, to the puzzle. I see. Excellent. Well, um, so I'm going to move on. Yeah, um, wake up, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit more about Emesal? Um, what it is, how it was used, how it differs from regular Sumerian, maybe. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I'll keep this very basic, uh, obviously, because... Um, so, so Sumerian... Um, was known as... Um, yeah, that's not a good way to do that, is it? Emesol means... Emma means tongue, sol means thin or fine in Sumerian, so it's like a, a fine tongue, fine speech. Um, and what we know when you look back through Sumerian literature and Sumerian texts, you see that Emesol is 
in in a lot of ways women's language um that's way too broad and and i wouldn't i wouldn't Bro- no, bro- broad, it way, but... broad strokes is good at the moment so it's you see it being used by goddesses and that's correct. female protagonists in mythology and literature that's right and and so when you have women for example in um in literary texts that are shown lamenting or wailing mm-hmm. uh, about a catastrophe or something um you know those sorts of those sorts of things um the fact that you have women lamenting and then laments are written in this this emisol language i mean this emisol dialect mm-hmm. or sociolect um there, there seems to be a strong connection as you said goddesses uh, speak in emisol in regular literary texts um and you see it in sort of hybrid um literary and liturgical texts that are um laments over cities uh, you have a lot of MSO in there. And so it, it seems to be um, the language of lamenting, perhaps because um, women initially were those that wailed and lamented. Um, and since it was a woman's language or a, related to women, um, that when it came down particularly into the old Babylonian period, uh, it's sort of meshed with these lament texts and this lament um, um, genre. Mm-hmm. Now, interestingly, the Gala priest was, um, you know, biologically male. There's debate, of course, or not of course to the people listening, but there's debate about um, is, uh, is, is the Gala, um, and we don't have to go into that now, but like in a more effeminate role, um, you know, is there, can, is there a third gender, you know, associated with them, that sort of thing. Uh, but, but that sort of all plays into this emisol. So uh, practically speaking, emisol is a way of spelling Sumerian words differently. So for example, the word inim, the word for word, what? um, inim, I N I M in Sumerian. It, it's written with one sign. It's written with a ka sign. Uh, inim in emisol is spelled e, ne, n three. So, you know the the i goes to e, um, uh, in both places, and then the m is replaced with a nasalized g, mm-hmm. and it's written with three different signs. So, those sorts of replacements <clears throat> are are very common. It's been argued that it, it softens mm-hmm. the language a little bit, um, so harder sounds are replaced with softer sounds, I and mean, that's not always true. But uh, you know, and of course, that excuse me seems to. You know, it's been argued that that plays in with masculine to feminine softening the the sound. But the the big thing to to uh, to know about it is that it changes the spellings of words. Um, so you have to know that. Um, when you come to a Sumerian text, you, you're not going to see words spelled, regular words spelled in the same mm-hmm. way. And when you see them spelled differently, you can know this is an MSL text. And if it's in this period, it's probably a lament or associated with lament or mm-hmm. it's a goddess speaking. Okay. Excellent. Um, so we, you kind of touched briefly on the purpose of the laments to um, assuage the heart of an angry deity. Um, how, how was that? thought to work Hmm. Um, is there particular imagery imagery in the text was it designed to appeal to the gods sympathetic nature if the god had a sympathetic nature yeah i mean i i would say so um maybe this will help the 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 names of uh these these texts so there are two two kinds of lament texts that we see in the old Babylonian period. One is called the Balang, and the Balang takes its name from the, uh, a drum or a harp. Uh, we're not 100% sure which one it is. I think it's a drum. But um, but it's the instrument on which uh, the lament was played. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think there's really good evidence for it being a drum. But um, so they would you know, play on whatever instrument it was and lament to the god 
singing or reciting both um, uh, the other one is called the air shema so air two tears shem five is the shem drum so tears of the shem drum um, and again the same thing it's a lamenting text uh, you know tears obviously um, so I you know if you read through these texts essentially what you're seeing is um, hey Enlil uh, hey Inanna um, hey Enki bad stuff's gonna go down if you leave let me describe it to you um, you know that you, you have descriptions of the god leaves and tall grass grows mm -hmm. inside of the city and along the city walls um, hoarder you know hoarders uh, marauders come in from the outside and destroy the town um, a mother is separated from her child you know the uh, the goats go along dragging their beards in the dirt you know so this this type of imagery that you see is just um, you know the uh, the temples are plundered, the city is ravished, you know, people are carried off into captivity. And you would, I mean, it's, you know, people have thought, oh, well, this is historical representation, right? They're describing destructions that actually took place, but, but no. It's hypothetical um, if it's you hypothetical. let this would happen. Do you, so I know that we can't answer this for certainty. Do you think that the laments were intended to evoke sympathy and pity from the gods towards their people in the city or intended to um, a play on their pride and self-importance and say, you're so amazing, you can't possibly leave. If you left, all these bad things would happen. The only reason they don't happen is because you're here and you're amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think probably those two things go hand in Bit hand. Both. You know, I'm thinking about, for example, um, I mean... <laughs> I mean, if you think about any Sumerian or Akkadian literary text, uh, you know, the, those are the things that you play on, right? Uh, they're yeah. um, any hymn dedicated to a, a deity. Uh, you're the awe-inspiring thing. You're Melamu. You're um, aura. Is your aura? Like... You know, it, it destroys all the lands. You know, you're so incredible. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you even see this in. Um, you know, not to go far afield or anything, but you see this in the biblical text. Um, you know, Yahweh is uh, called upon to don't abandon your people for your own namesake. Um, you know, you don't want, you don't want, it, we're your people. And, you know, if your people get destroyed, what's that going to say mm -hmm. about you? So don't let us get destroyed. You know, and you see that sort of thing. Yeah, of course, you and I both know, but just for the audience, um, I don't know why I said that. Um they may know it too. What do I know? Uh, you know, each city had its own deity. And so you have border conflicts and you have, uh, it's pictured as, mm. um, you know, two cities fight. Celestial battles. Yeah, it's a celestial battle, right? This God versus that God. And so, you know, appealing to, appealing to them saying, hey, you know, um, <laughs> you don't want to be beaten uh, because if your city gets beaten, I mean, I, I, I would say that it's probably both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so it, when you were giving us the overview of your dissertation, you said that you also looked at curricular texts um, to try and understand if the laments had a place in the scribal curriculum. What did you come to a conclusion on that? Yeah, so maybe I'll talk about the curriculum for a second, just so I can kind of give everybody a background. Um, and I've got a video, we've got a video going up this week, I think. Yeah. Um, sort of a teaser on uh, scribal education. And it's a, it's a really, it, it, was, it became popular maybe the past 30 years. Um, looking at it again, it was popular you know, 60 years ago my math is right but anyway um a lot a lot has been written on it in the past 10 years in particular uh, my advisor um up at hopkins dr paul Dimero, i've written extensively mm -hmm. about this and brilliant articles and uh you know if you can get a hold of them or write me and i can get them and get you copies uh it's just it's fascinating work that he's done and uh really laid the groundwork for my work i of course that's how it works and in a dissertation, but um, 
you know, the curriculum is sort of set up during the old Babylonian period in this way. You didn't have these these mass schools that kids went to or that scribal students went to. Um, that that probably happened during the Or III period, which was, you know, much more standardized. It was a few hundred years before the period that's we're talking right. about now. Sorry, that's right. So 2100 to 2000. Um, but during the old Babylonian period, t- time of Hammurabi, Samsu Alunos, that, that, that sort of period, you have um, homeschooling, in a sense. And, uh, of course, we have archaeological evidence for that. In the city of Nippur, uh, we have some, a place called House F, and you know, we can talk about that at another time. But, but essentially, um, what we have is uh, students started copying um, lists. They, so they would, co- they, they would copy out simple sign lists, then they would copy out vocabulary it's, lists. So it's, it's kind of like what our five-year-old is currently doing at school. She'll sit and she'll write A, A, right. A, B, B, B. And then once she's mastered the basic alphabet, alphabet she'll move on to writing cat, dog, That's exactly fish. Right. Just a, a little more things. complicated because cuneiform is not as simple as a, a Roman alphabet. Right, that's, and, and that's a that's a really great uh, comparison. So um, they would memorize; they just memorized all the time. And so you had these long vocabulary lists. You had um, mathematical texts. They uh, would would um, copy out uh, mock legal texts and letters. And, of course, all of these things played into what they were going to be doing as scribes, right? So they were going to have to write all these things. And so understanding the formula, um, understanding the templates, you know, whatever they were going to have to write is really important. But when you write a letter, this is how you start it. This is how you finish it. That's right. This is how a a legal contract is formed. That's right. And um, so you had this sort of the elementary curriculum. And I use that term kind of loosely as we can talk about later but um and then you had the more advanced curriculum and when you got to the advanced side uh, they were copying out literary texts and uh, there were many of them there's a, a set group of texts that you find over and over again in different cities and what they did is they would essentially and this was uh you know thanks to again thanks to the work of uh, my advisor, but it was determined that uh, essentially they were copying out a quarter, you know, one fourth of each literary te- the literary text that they were copying. They they memorize a quarter of it at a time, and then once they'd memorized all four parts of it, then they would take a larger tablet and write the whole thing out from memory. And it's really fascinating to read his work because you can see uh, you can see some of these texts. W- they have dates on them mm-hmm. you know, when they actually when the, the student actually wrote it so you can see he wrote this one on this day and then he How wrote long this it one took. on this day uh, yeah and, and so um, there are ways that um, it has been determined in what order uh, this curriculum uh, the students copied out these texts so just as a sort of in general um, tablet type tablet formation tablet form gives us an idea um, of what order these things were copied out and so there's a certain tablet type called a lentil and the lentil you know um, has more rudimentary looking signs on it simple exercises Uh, later there was um, a tablet type that had two columns on it on the on the left hand side it was a very nice hand you know writing and uh, that was clearly the uh, the teacher and then on the right was palimpsest so that would you know they, the student would copy out those signs or sign, those lines and then they'd erase and wipe them and it do clean. It again so you could actually see if you turn the thing sideways you, know, you can see it's thinner on this side because mm-hmm. they keep rubbing the clay off and um of course then you have uh, other types but you can see based on uh what's on the the front, what's on the back, you can, we, we've been able to, Nick Feldhaus was able to piece together, um, in general, how, uh, what order these texts were, these compositions were, and whatever they were copied. So part of what I was doing um, was was going to the Kish, um, 
the KISS tablets and saying what was there in the curriculum, what curricular texts were there, and is there any way that we can determine not so much the order because they were so fragmentary you couldn't really tell. Um, you can't tell um, what texts were and what tablet type. And... That's right, the tablet type. Um, also, I didn't have direct access to the tablets, mm. which is a, you know, one of the things that's a shortcoming um, of the of the dissertation. And I'm sure that'll, you know, be be corrected um, later on down the road when those tablets become more available. But um, what I was looking for is the content of the curriculum. So, did they copy the same kinds of texts? And yes and no uh, was the answer. So. Yes, the literary texts that were copied, um, the, the elementary texts that were copied, there's a lot of parallel, right? Um, what we see at Kish, though, is there's an awful lot of Akkadian, um, which was not, I, I don't want to say it was, it certainly wasn't unheard of, and I wouldn't even call it rare, but they're... But disproportionately large disproportionately compared to large. other sites. That's right, and... Um, so Sumerian, you know, Sumerian was a dead language by this point, right? I mean, I think that's, I think that's reasonably clear. And so the, the place that uh, Sumerian stayed alive um, was, you know, with the scribes. And so in scribal schools, Sumerian was a huge part of their learning, right? Um, and it was sort of understood in the major scribal center of Nippur that everybody knew Akkadian already. It was the lingua franca, you know, it was the, it was, everybody knew that. Um, so you didn't have to see a lot of Akkadian exercises there because they already knew that, that everybody can write Akkadian at Nippur because that's like the elite scribal school, but, or the elite scribal center. But at a, uh, up in Kish, or, you know, that, that wasn't necessarily the case. And since Akkadian was such a big part, uh, arguably, of the, uh, of daily life, um, for those scribes writing a lot more Akkadian, um, then uh, you'd see it more in the curriculum, and, and, and you know that's 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 what we see. Uh, so the conclusion that I drew was that even though there's a curriculum in the sense that in general what the students learned was pretty common from city to city during the period, we do see that it wasn't something that all of the you know the teachers got together. It wasn't a principal and and from each city that got together and they sat and there was a so board So what are we going to be teaching said, them this year? Yeah, so what, yeah, that's right. What are we going to do? The laments have uh, been working well, but maybe let's add something a little lighter. That's right. Um, that it was, it was that uh, much more flexible that a, uh, an instructor could say, my students are going to need to know how to use Akkadian more or, um, you know, in a different way. Um, a good example of this in the curriculum is, uh, again, my advisor um, showed this at the city of Orr. Uh, there was a, a much more uh, emphasis, a specific emphasis that was uh, unique to the city of Orr uh, in those texts, and, which differed from Kish. And um, so you, you can see that the instructors had the freedom to sort of alter or adjust their, their curriculum uh, in order to fit the fit local needs. So that's I why think, you know, I think I'm right in saying that the scribal texts from all prioritize Nana. That's right. The moon god, that's which right. he was the patron god of all, over and above over and above other deities. That's right. Which is not seen in, in other cities. That's right. And um, so you can see this sort of local variation uh, was was uh, you know, obviously permissible. That's probably mm -hmm. not the right word because it's it's not this overarching, again, Board of Education saying, yeah, yeah, you can modify it. So, um, but expected, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the practice. So, um, so that kind of deals with the curriculum. Uh, the same sort of thing is seen in the laments. So there's, there's local variation uh, to some degree with... Um, with, uh, and, and I think this is important to know just from a religious standpoint, um, there's variation in the text themselves. So 
for example, that well-known text, Urama Irabi, has a line in there that says, uh, talking about Inanna, that says, destroyer of lands, lady of the Ayana. You know, um, Which was her temple name. That's correct. Um, but uh, at Kish, her temple is Horsang Kalama. And so in the Kish text, it says, destroyer of uh, the lands, lady of Horsan Kalama. So if you were to put up the duplicates together, you know, you see same line, same line, same line. Then it gets to that line, and it's all the same except Ayana is replaced with Horsan Kalama. Mm. So, which makes sense, right? Um, so that type of, it, what that says is that you, di you didn't have a, a text that was fixed in the sense that um, it was, you know, blasphemous or something. To, to, change to change it, they text. could be changed as necessary depending on the time and place they were being written in. That's right, and to fit the local ritual. I mean, it wouldn't make a lot of sense um, to have uh, a temple of Uruk being called, you know, called upon uh, there at when you're in during Kish, a ritual. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. Um, not not that that sorry, not not that that didn't happen because that certainly does come up in other mm -hmm. texts, but. Um, so I should be careful about that, but 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 certainly this was modified to fit that particular ritual in that particular moment. It made um, it was appropriate to have Horsan Kalma uh, replace replace the Ayana, and you see this sort of thing. Um, I'm just looking down at my notes here, in uh, in several different places. So um, that's just a really clear one mm. that, that I can talk about. Um, there. <laughs> So the, the structure of the major type of lament, and please, I, I will just keep talking. So please break in and say you need to shut up now. <laughs> uh, that'll be absolutely fine. And you know this being my wife. Um, what was I saying? The structure of the laments. Ah, so the balong, the, the major lament that you see in the old Babylonian period, or the longer lament that you see, is made up of these sections of text and they're called kirugus in sumerian catchy um, name thank you um, it means something but there's no reason to go into that here um but these kirugus are essentially just blocks of text and when you actually look at the tablet um they're blocked off see... aren't they with lines above yeah, and like, beneath like a double line mm -hmm. so if you hold the tablet up you know you'll see these double lines uh, and they say it is the first Kirugu it is the second Kirugu all the way down um, it doesn't always say Kirugu the double lines can indicate Kirugu it can indicate that that's a section but one of the things that's really interesting that came up very quickly when I started working on these texts was I, I tried to make a score I've talked about that I think in other interviews um, you know, I tried to take all the duplicates of a particular text and bring them together and line and, them up and try and, and get one master copy the problem that i saw was that you would let's say you had a tablet of urama irbi and you were going to use that as your base tablet mm -hmm. right so you put it was really clear it was really well preserved so you you copied that out as your base you didn't copy it you typed it out because it's 2018 anyway um, so you've got that as your base text. Now you're going to put all the indiv other individual lines underneath of it. Uh, underneath. And what you would find is that uh, you'd have a kirugu, a whole kirugu, a whole section that was perfectly duplicated uh, that fit into the middle of Urama Irabi. Like let's say this kirugu is kirugu 3 in Urama Irabi. It fit perfectly in there. But the Kirugu before it, the Kirugu after it, really everything before it and everything had nothing to do with Urama Irabi. Oh. It was just pulled out. You know, that's what it looked like. It was just pulled out and put in this text, right? And then you'd look at another text, and the first Kirugu, maybe it was the fifth Kirugu. And, and in other words, you just, you had these Kirugus, um, and of course, this isn't a discovery that I made. Uh, you know, this has been made folk, uh, Conrad Folk out in uh, Tübingen talks about this extensively they're called fezatstücke uh so like replaceable parts you know that you, you could move them around interchangeable parts 
and um, almost like I likened it to um, you know if you've ever heard anybody pray um, and they're, they're kind of making up an ad hoc prayer for like Thanksgiving or something or if it's somebody's birthday or if there's a retirement and you say hey would you mind praying for us there are these certain blocks in a prayer that people will say uh, we've always chuckled about uh, bless this food to our bodies nourish it yeah, to our that, body yeah nourish that's what it is nourish Bizarre this phrasing. food to our bodies but you hear that it's a it's like a stock phrase right um lord we thank you for this day right those sorts of things but but they don't have to go in a particular order they often do but those things but can move around you can put them in wherever feels appropriate for the time and then you that's right, and then you can add a block like, and thank you so much as Jimmy's retiring today, he's mm -hmm. been such a great guy, that can just sort of be inserted to fit the ritual, mm -hmm. right, to fit the prayer. Um, and that's sort of how these, these Fezat Shtuka work. So, you know, you can, you can take these Kirugas and you can move them around to sort of fit what you're getting ready to do. Now, when you got into the first millennium, it became pretty standardized. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have this sort of interplay, not, you know, to anywhere near the same degree. Um, and so, uh, part of what I was doing was trying to see, um, you know, what is there continuity with the, um, with the other cities, with the first millennium text. And what I found is that there are actually a lot of Kirugas that aren't duplicated anywhere else, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I, I edited a text with, um, the help of Conrad Folk. Uh, uh, called it was uh, the, the tablet is proc b471 there's gonna be a quiz later everybody so you make sure you remember that but um it was funny because i remember translating through it and of course it's you know got a lot of phonetic writings in it and i remember coming up with these this translation trying to figure out what it said and i thought i can't find these these lines anywhere else like there's a whole list of temple names I can't find these temple names anywhere. And I remember finishing the edition and going, okay, I've got to have Professor Folk look at this. And he's going to just tear it to shreds uh, because I... I, I you I can't find any wrong. references for what you're looking at. And they, they, they just don't seem to exist anywhere else, at least th that we found, uh, which was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the, you know, some of the text is duplicated. Um, but a lot of it's not. So that was kind of neat uh, to be able to come to a, a text and, and to give it a, you know, sort of a, take a first shot at it. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I'm sure there are fantastic scholars out there. Gregoire uh, Nicolette is uh, working on the proc text now, um, all the Kish texts, I'm sure. And, um, you know, I'm sure he's going to make some tremendous, tremendous uh, insights into it. But I, I had fun. So hopefully, you know, my work can help. Somewhere. having a first stab um, are there any other um, any other of your conclusions that you'd like to share or did we cover everything well um, sorry is that your way of saying you've gone really long and winded <laughs> no not at all that was my way of saying we should finish soon sorry okay but so we definitely have time for more conclusions there's one more one more big part that I looked into and that was the unorthographic writings or the phonetic writings mm -hmm. so Part of the the part of what I was trying to tackle was um, what do these texts say, these laments say that are written phonetically that aren't duplicated somewhere else. So again, as we were talking about before, if you have a line, a Sumerian line, um, that you know what it says in other tablets, you can sort of piece together, um, you know, how it's represented in the in the phonetic writing. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have um, if you don't have, uh, you know, what it's supposed to say in Sumerian, <coughs> if, if you don't know what it's supposed to say in Sumerian, yeah. um, then it's, you have to kind of come up with it on your own. And, um, I don't know, did we freeze? You're frozen on my screen. Oh, I have. Am I frozen? No, you're still good. Am I looking like this? <laughs> no. Um... Well, it's a beautiful picture of you here, frozen, Thanks. so it's fine. Uh, of course, that's it's difficult to not be. Anyway, sorry. Um, so 
what I found, just in short, there was a, uh, I was trying to find, is there a system? Is there something that um, I can really lay out a system to show, okay, if we come now to another unduplicated text, if we find a text or if we're, that's written phonetically and we don't have a duplicate of it, can I, form, <coughs> can I generate a system the way that they spelled these words, the way that they wrote them out? So, so if someone else this. comes upon one of these texts, they, sorry, I've got something in my throat they can go to your dissertation and say, oh, I have this same spelling, this is the word that is being represented here. That's exactly right. Um, no. <laughs> 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 um, and while there are patterns, there, no doubt there are patterns, um, they're not consistent, they are general patterns, but they're not consistent in the specifics. Um, and, and what was interesting is there is a, there's a lexical series, a lexical list series called proto -Ea, and it doesn't matter if anybody knows what that means. Essentially what it is is one column uh, has um, Sumerian words, Sumerian signs, and in the other column it writes them out what these signs sounded like phonetically. Okay. So you would In phonetic Akkadian. In um, so, sorry, they're writing it for an Akkadian speaker to sound it out? No, it's just it's just trying to show how that word okay. sounded. Yeah. Um, so, there's a system, and, and the students knew it, right? They had to copy proto -Aya. So they, they had this system in place to write phonetically. And so one of the thoughts was, oh, well... <laughs> You know, if we just go to these phonetic texts, we're pro if we just use proto ea and how they write it out, it's probably exactly the same. Not even close. Um, there's no consistency between those two, which is really strange to think about. I mean, if you have a system for writing phonetically, why not why use wouldn't it? You had to use memorize it. it. Why yeah. not use it? And um, my conclusion was because there's so much variation, because they change. Even the way they spell one word phonetically changes. From is that to is that a, a scribe to scribe variation, or do you get variations within the same tablet? Even within the same tablet. What I concluded was, uh, this is my hypothesis anyway, my working hypothesis. If if you've ever been to a graduation, and someone says to you, "Hey, uh, you're going to be walking across the stage." Um, and your name is, um, you know, uh, my name, for example, uh, we would like you to write it out phonetically so that the person reading through the list of names can, can pronounce. pronounce your name correctly. So, you know, somebody might pronounce my last name Bowen, right, or Bowman. Uh, and so <clears throat> if I were to write it out phonetically, I might write B-O-W-H-E-N. Owen. But if you catch me at a different time, I might write uh, B O W dash W H E N, mm -hmm. right? A, a, a little variation there. Um, so I think that's at least affecting how they write these things. Um, mm -hmm. And that sort of plays into what I think these phonetic writings are doing. Now, you know, certainly don't, uh, you know, don't go hanging your hat on what I'm getting ready to say. This is just my, this is my, uh, my working hypothesis. But given that there's no consistency in how these words are written out phonetically, no real consistency, mm -hmm. um, and there is a, there's sort of a, I'll say the, the, the idea and then, um, or what my conclusion was and then, uh, my, my piece of evidence that I think is um, pretty good. Um, these texts were performed, I and mean, we know that. Uh, we have a Mari ritual, for example, where we see these texts being performed, um, these laments. And because Sumerian was a dead language, and there were people that were, you had musicians, you had people singing, you, um, you know, had, had other people participating sometimes in this performance, it's highly likely that not all the people participating or playing or singing 
um, would know how to read Sumerian and certainly wouldn't know how to read MSL. MSL. Right. So um, you might expect, for example, if uh, you were going to take part in a Latin um, mass, mass, right, and you didn't read Latin, you could still pronounce it because it's written in you know with uh, in English characters, right? So you might not know what you were saying, but you could pronounce it out loud, and you see it all the time. I hear it, for example, when people talk about Hebrew and Greek texts on YouTube. Um, you know, they'll pronounce the words, and they 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 put the emphasis in the wrong place, or they they make it a uh, they make the words sound strange because they're reading it in English characters and they, they, they don't know how it sounded and that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same would be true, I think, in this case. So let's say you had a person that was going to sing or that was going to pronounce this thing out loud. The scribe, the priest, sorry, the gala priest might sit down and say, all right, how can I write this thing? So it can be pronounced by someone who does not read MSL. That's right. This Akkadian, per, this person that can read Akkadian, that speaks Akkadian, how can I write it so that they can read it? And what you, what you would expect to see coming to that is that the complicated Sumerian signs would be replaced with simpler Sumerian, um, simpler cuneiform signs. Um, and that's what you see when you ch- when you change these. Uh, for the most part, statistically speaking, if a word is written out phonetically, it's written out with simpler signs, ones that are easier to read and understand. Ones that people are more likely to know. That's right. And the one big thing that tells me that this is at least a good working hypothesis is that there is no Q letter, uh, Q sound, what we represent as a Q sound in Sumerian, but it shows up in a lot of these texts from Kish. And there is a Q in Akkadian. And there, sorry, and there is a Q in Akkadian that's used a lot. So it makes sense that if you were an Akkadian speaker and I were trying to write out a Sumerian text so that you could at least pronounce it mm-hmm. to the god, um, I would write it out in Akkadian using Akkadian, using signs that you would use in Akkadian as well so that you could read it and pronounce it out loud. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, one little uh, wrench that was thrown into this, and then I will shut up, I promise. (laughs) One little uh, fly in the ointment for me was that there was a specific set of um, phonetic writings that went from simple to complex, and really complex, relatively speaking. And it was was really confusing for me, because I was like, why is this happening? But they all show up in literary texts. Which would not be pronounced. Well, mm, maybe. I mean, you know, some of them would certainly the hymns. Um, oh, but, right. But, but, but more to, maybe more important, um, who was copying these things? The students. Students are copying these texts. And the advanced students are the ones copying the advanced text, which is where these more advanced signs are showing up. And we have this showing up in other cities where a scribal student is showing off. Hey, look, the zoo sign, which is the pronoun for you, um, if you if you attach zoo to the end of the Sumerian word is you, or, uh, uh, sorry, your, uh, your mm-hmm. um, um, sorry. <laughs> um, they write it with the, the ka sign, which is zoo too, which is a really weird way uh, to write zoo mm-hmm. as just bizarre and you wouldn't see it but this you know I, I, my you know my my thought here is that a, a scribal student is sitting down and saying guess what I can write this in this really esoteric way I know that ka can be read zoo too and so I'm going to replace the really common and well known mm-hmm. zoo and write it with a ka sign uh, to show that I, hey guess what look at this check it out I'm, uh, this is how good I am um and it's interesting because you do see patterns uh, that, that sort of substantiate that. At least I think they substantiate it um, reasonably. Um, and it answers the question. It fits the model. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, that was really neat. So the, the two big things were the curriculum, uh, the curricular text, pretty common. I mean, uh, pretty standardized for what text could be copied 
I mean, with the individual text, what was in them, but there could be the choice of which text to put in mm -hmm. and which text, to, which compositions to leave out. And um, in the Lamentational liturgies, you know, they could modify them to fit local consumption, local needs. And the uh, phonetic writings, I think, were used to make it um, easier or possible for people to either read the text aloud or to read it to themselves to follow along if they were playing a musical instrument or something like that. They could follow along in the ritual where they were. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions for Josh, please just leave them in the comments. Um, either we'll get back to you and answer, um, reply to your comment, or we'll just make another video and answer everyone's questions all at once. But thank you, Josh, and I hope thank everybody you. enjoyed this kind of long discussion.